On the third biggest island of the western basin of the Mediterranean Sea, the French tree color waves in the wind. The 183 kilometer long and 83 kilometer wide Corsica lies 170 kilometers from the mainland, 80 kilometers from the Italian coast, and only 12 kilometers from Sardinia. The most southerly settlement of the island is Bonifacio. According to the famous Corsican-born French poet Paul Valéry, this is the most scenic town of the island. His opinion is shared by millions of tourists who go on pilgrimage to this island even every year. In Italian, the place which got its name from the Margrave Bonifaz of Tuscany in 828 is pronounced Bonifacio, and in French, Bonifacio. The fortress, and together with it the town also, later fell under Genoan, Pisan, French, and then Turkish rule. The harbor stretches along the side of a 1.5 kilometer long bay. The bay is separated from the sea by a 60 meter high cliff. Its strategic importance is further enhanced by the citadel built on the cliff and the narrow entrance of the bay. The town endured many sieges and they collected rainwater in huge cisterns, so even during the siege, they were not in want. Even the flying buttresses of the famous Santa Maria Maggiore served to collect water in the cisterns carved in the rock under the hall. The Genoa Gate was the only entrance to the upper town. Today, we can find here the Municipal History Museum. The 187 steps named after the King of Aragon was allegedly carved into the rock by the besiegers, but a local woman, Margarita Bobia, discovered them, so the attack failed. We can find two monuments in the upper town. World War I took 40,000 victims on the island. Practically every fifth Corsican died in this catastrophe. The other monument is the Légion d'Estranger, or the French Foreign Legion. From 1897, they sacrificed their lives in several places and for several causes. The monument was transported here from Oran. In the old town, barracks and three churches are reminiscent of the past. The 13th century Romanesque church has been rebuilt many times. Its peculiarity is the crescent-shaped arcade loggia resting on a wooden roof frame. The octagonal belfry has not retained its original form, and the interior is also eclectic. The narrow alleys leading through the tall medieval houses are always dim and chilly. The wash is put out to dry on lines, and one can find several handicraft shops on the ground floor. The narrow houses are decorated with coats of arms. It's as if the wheel of time had been turned back. Joseph Palfi wrote, The atmosphere of timelessness is more real. We cannot see trees in this town. It's all rocks and stones. The light is reflected from the limestone cliffs and whitewashed houses, blinding. And on two sides, there's the sea, the azure of the Mediterranean sung of so many times and still seeming unbelievable. The southern side of the harbor is the port for sailing and motorboats, and this is where the cruise ships depart from also. The marina is still under the protection of St. Erasmus. On June 2nd, a spectacular procession is held in his honor. A month later, the patron saint of sea crayfish fishers is celebrated similarly. Those who set sail on board a ship to the coastal waters of Bonifacio will understand why Corsica is called the Island of Beauty. Even the Greeks of the antiquity gave it the attribute Caliste, or beautiful. The giant mountain besieged by waves is the daughter of the Alps, a range of high peaks, which set its foot so enormously in the sea with its narrow bays, promontories, and gorges. This is Corsica. It's a raw and free land which has life so powerful and so unique that nobody could leave their handprint permanently, and its sons never served other than the choice of their hearts. These are the thoughts of 20th century French writer Octave Aubry. During the one-hour cruise, we can look back to the 60 to 90 meter high cliffs and the citadel. They will show us the St. Anthony Cave which resembles Napoleon's hat, the rock nicknamed the Rudder of Corsica, the Sand Grain Stone, and of course, 
the local twin to the Blue Cave of Capri, the Saragonato Cave. The mountain mass is bordered by a thousand kilometers of zigzagging coast in which only 30 meters from the sea, 2,000 meter high mountains rise to the sky. Their tops are covered by snow until June when the sea already attracts bathers. The rivers rushing down from the mountains deepen steep walled valleys and canyons and reaching flat areas, they form floodplains with their sluggish currents. At their estuaries, great beaches have been created. There are places where the bays of the cliffs are filled in with rough grain sand and at some places with fine white sand. Transparent, shallow water glitters in the crescent bays. Gently sloping dunes, attractive lagoons, steep gray or red cliffs, the landscape is amazing, whether we see it from the coast or from the sea. As a young officer, Napoleon was the commander of the Civil Guard of Bonifacio. It was he who said that even before laying our eyes on Corsica, we can smell its scent. Half of the island is still ruled by the Macha. The tall scrub jungle is fragrant even in itself, but this is further enhanced by the scent of spices and flowers running riot. The myrtle, the lavender, the sage, the thyme, and the rosemary grow wild here, and only botanists could list what else. The locals also use the wild herbs and spices. In the impenetrable thickness of the matcha, flocks of rabbits, turtles, wild birds, and butterflies live. On the higher cliffs, mouflon graze on the scarce vegetation of the rocks. The island also serves as a resting place for birds migrating from Europe to Africa. Corsica is visited by a growing number of tourists who come here to fish or hunt. The locals try to protect their treasures more and more consciously. They carefully change the fish stock of the rivers, and they also limit the quantity that can be caught. One third of the island has been declared a nature reserve, and the rest of the areas also enjoy some level of protection. Porto Vecchio is the third most populated city of Corsica today, the dynamic growth of which can be attributed to tourists. From the Genoan Tower, a magnificent view opens up to the harbor, the sea salt distillers, and to the entire bay framed by cork oaks and evergreens. The fortress, the building of which began in 1539, incorporating the old town, rises above the small harbor. The magical atmosphere of old houses blending into the city wall surround an intimate little piazza. The area of Porto Vecchio is primarily famous for its handicrafts. The wool products are well known, together with the clay and ceramic pots, and the jewelry. They carve articles for personal use, primarily from olive wood, with its interesting pattern. It's often supplemented by cork. The wicker articles, woven from willow branches, have been popular for centuries. They're also sold in numberless variations. Those who smoke pipes can't go home without a nicely carved Corsican pipe and every man's heart beats faster when they see the knives and daggers. We're at a place where vendetta has a great tradition. Fortunately, the daggers, the handles of which are made of mouflon horns, are used for more peaceful purposes. The better quality handicrafts can be bought in the shops of Casa d'Artegiani. In the 1960s, when the lack of jobs caused immigration to grow, and the little mountain villages were threatened by depopulation, determined artists and craftsmen established this little cooperative. The Casa d'Artigiani has by now created a system that is spread all over the islands. The main idea is that these craftsmen and artisans maintain workshops where they make and sell traditional handmade Corsican articles for personal use and ornaments. All this is done so that visitors can watch them work. For the customers, the articles are more valuable if they have a picture or a video of their making. Don't forget, all shops have a long siesta at noon, so we should plan our shopping for the morning or early evening.
Let's continue our journey from Porto Vecchio to the mountain area of the inland of the island. Corte was founded by the Moors in the 11th century. Back then, it was called Mascara. The Genoans occupied it three centuries later. Its citadel was built by the viceroy of Corsica, Count Vincentello d'Istria. In the 18th century, the city became the heart of Corsica, the center of opposition. The two great patriots were born here who devoted their whole lives to the independence of Corsica. Other than Bonaparte, the two most noteworthy sons of the island are Jean-Pierre Gaffori, Dr. General, and the even more well-known Pasquale Paoli. The latter, while he was governor, made Corte the capital of the island. Moreover, he also established a university here. Corte lies 600 meters above sea level on a long stretching slope, from which the cliff, crowned by the citadel, rises magnificently. The ancient holidays of the little villages not only attract the locals nowadays, they've become events that draw lots of tourists. Pasquale Paoli was the leader of the War of Independence that started in 1729. First he fought the Genoans. Later he fought the French after Louis XV bought the island. Later he called the English for assistance and proclaimed Corsica an independent kingdom. This, however, lasted only for two years. Napoleon, when he was young, was the enthusiastic follower of Paoli and an advocate of Corsica's independence. As an emperor, however, he only focused on the interests of the French Empire. Corte is still the center of efforts for independence. Here we can see the flag with the Turks' head more often than in other cities of the island. The statue of Paoli stands on the square named after him, at the upper end of a pleasant pedestrian and shopping street. Nearby, on the old house of the eponymous general, Gafferini Palace, we can still see the marks hit by bullets in the siege. From here, cobblestone alleys lead up to the citadel, which were barracks of the Foreign Legion until 1983. In the little house opposite the Belvedere lookout place, Charles-Marie Bonaparte once lived with his wife, and this is where their first son was born, who was followed by 12 more children. On Corsica, many religious holidays are celebrated. There's one almost every week. Especially the holidays around Easter and Christmas are large scale, but the name day of the patron saint of the settlement is always a spectacular event. The name Alexandre Gustave Eiffel was made famous by the 300 meter tower of Paris, although he'd been a significant architect even before that. The Observatory of Nice and the Bordeaux Bridge are also attached to his name. The father of elaborate iron constructions worked in Hungary also. On the island of Corsica, there's a viaduct that commemorates him. The railway bridge spans over a cleft of one of the mountains around Corte. Earlier, several bridges had been built by the Genoans to speed up the traffic on the rocky and sloping island. All Corsican bridges are high so that they won't be swept away by the fast-flowing floods. The high mountains of the inland of the island offer an unforgettable sight for nature lovers. The most popular destination is the reservoir of Calacuccia, the glacier valley of Montezinto, the granite canyons of Santa Regina, and the crystal clear waterfall of the Cascade de Sangle. The view is especially nice from the top of the Mont Doro and the Monte Renose. From here, we can take delight in the sun sinking into the sea 
and in clear weather, even the more distant islands are easily visible. The next destination of our journey also lies on the seacoast. The second biggest city of the island, Bastia, was built on the ground of the Roman Cardo, which commemorates its ancestors from the antiquity with the villa district. Its present-day name was given after the Italian word Bastalia, meaning watchtower or bastion. The bastions and the fortress walls were built by the Genoans. They soon made the city their territorial capital. A significant industry was developed here. This is where the iron ore mined on the island of Elba was processed. Due to this, Bastia was the only city in Corsica that was hit by a bomb in World War II. Although Bastia is still a significant economic center, tourism is also increasingly important. Its new harbor was built especially for big ferries, which link Corsica to the harbors of Italy and France. Airports can also be found in Ajaccio and in Bastia. The center of the city is the St. Nicholas Square, close to the harbor. Every morning on the large square, a flea market is held. Otherwise, it's framed by shopping streets and intimate cafes with wicker chairs on the terraces. We can have a good café au lait here, or we can try something less common, like the cedar liquor or the myrtle spirits. A customary Napoleon statue stands on the square next to several other monuments. It's the artwork of Bartolini. To the south, the impressive block of the Hotel de Ville, the city hall, closes the square. The layout of streets and squares seems French. In the case of the residents of the island and their language, it's not so obvious. Although most of the locals speak the literary French language, the Corsican language used for communication between them every day contains many more Italian and Iberian elements. The centuries-old Italian, most genuine influences, are still living, for instance in the pronunciation of place names. As far as the people are concerned, their temperament is definitely southern, Mediterranean. Still it's different from both Italian and French. They're still proud of their Corsican origin, and the separation from France, at least in Seoul, is not out of the question for them. The Baroque Church of John the Baptist faces the old harbor. Its lavishly ornamented inside, decorated with gold plates and stuccos, was formed in the 18th century. Its frescoes offer a misleading three-dimensional experience. Its organ is the work of the Saris brothers. In the summers, it's played by world-famous artists. The Old Harbor is perhaps the most colorful spot of the entire island. It's narrow, intimate, and busy. Looking back from the light tower of the famous Dragon Mole, we have the best view of the medley mix of fishing boats, little boats, and luxury yachts, and the two-tower church rising magnificently behind them. We can take beautiful pictures of the little poor but scenic houses hiding behind the forest of masts from the park stretching on the slope of the castle hill also. The old harbor of Bastia is the dream of photographers. We can see many professional and amateur painters at work. On stairs and steep winding streets framed by old houses, we can reach the citadel. Inside this stands the watchtower after which the city was named. In the old governor's palace, the richest ethnographic museum of Corsica has been established. The famous silver group of statues depicting the ascension of Virgin Mary is kept in the three-nave cathedral. Near to this watchtower are the directorates of all the museums of the island. Next to the wonder-working Black Cross Chapel, they still show the house in which Victor Hugo lived as a child, whose father served as an army officer in the garrison of Bastia. The cross itself, floating in the water, was found by two fishermen in the 1400s. Probably, it originates from a wrecked ship. There's no proof for its wonder-working nature. In spite of this, many people go on pilgrimages to this place, and on the 3rd of May, a big festival is held in its honor.
For four centuries, the palace of the governor of Genoa stood here, and the seat of the Corsican Council of Louis XV was also here. The gate was renovated in honor of the visit of Louis XVI. A steep road climbs up to the hanging gardens and the old gunpowder tower. Along the eastern coast of the island, in 1943, the ship was sunk on which German General Rommel transported his robbed treasure. Although they tried to rescue it after the war, the treasures could not be retrieved and returned to their rightful owner, the Italian National Bank. Erbalunga, with its colorful fishing harbor, its houses washing their foundations in the sea, its narrow streets, and ruined Genoan watchtower, offers a really scenic picture. Its main square, planted with sycamore trees, is a characteristically French sight. Sometimes, even the heirs of medieval bards, guitar-playing chocolateurs, appear here. The men of the city play the most typical French game, pétanque. Paul Valéry, one of the most significant French poets and essayists of the 20th century and a member of the French Academy, was born in the Valéry Castle in Erbalunga in 1871. The island of Corsica is divided geographically into 12 regions. The most northern is the Cap Corsa Peninsula, which is 40 kilometers long but only 10 kilometers wide. The middle of it is dominated by the ranges of the 1,307-meter-high Monte Stello and the 1,130-meter-high Monte Altichione. In its fertile valleys, grapes and citrus fruits are grown. On its coast, there are watchtowers reminiscent of the past. Past Erbalunga, there are beach resorts falling in line such as Santa Catarina, Roliano, Bacaggio, Pino and Nonza. The romantic landscape is also interesting geologically. The cliffs are covered by green slate stone plates. The winding mountain roads are framed by macchia shrubs. There were swamps here once, and mosquitoes spreading malaria lived here in large numbers. After World War II, they were exterminated by draining the swamps. The local tourist office warns everybody not to smoke in the macchia shrubs and not to build fires. The other danger threatening tourists are mountain roads that are often without guardrails. The owners of wrecked cars rusting down in the chasm below also thought that they could make the next curve. During excursions, we should not plan to average more than 40 kilometers an hour. It's best to buy an accurate tourist map on the spot. In the car rentals and the tourist information offices, we can even get them free. If our car breaks down in the mountains, a mobile phone comes in handy. If we need help and we don't speak French or Italian, we can try English and German. Especially in the areas near the coast, we can make ourselves understood. We can admire the Cup Course Peninsula from the top of Monticello. A large part of the trip can be done by car, and the sight is similar to what we would see from an airplane. Port Centuri is a new and continuously developing holiday resort of the island close to the top of Cap Corse. The many-faced island of Corsica is a paradise for those who seek active relaxation, reads the information leaflet of the local tourist office of Corsica. For exciting activities in the open air, Corsica is an ideal place. A thousand kilometers of coastline, crystal clear rivers, tourist roads, hills to climb, mountains more than 2,000 meters high, winding mountain roads uphill and downhill where bike riders can put their skills to the test. 
As a matter of fact, there's no such open-air sports activity that can't be done here. Besides excursions and mountain climbing, as non-water sports we can mention golf, off-road motorcycling, bicycling, and the horse riding. The rivers and the sea provide opportunity for snorkeling and deep sea diving, rafting, kayaking and canoeing, jet skiing, sailing, surfing, and swimming. For those who want to conquer the air, hang gliding, hot air ballooning, and paragliding can be recommended. And for sure, we haven't exhausted all the possibilities. The weather is just as diverse as the landscape. The winter is generally short and mild. Spring comes as early as February. In summer, it's very hot, especially inland, while the coastland is cooled by a mild breeze. Autumn is long and pleasant. We can expect more precipitation in the winter. July and August are the hottest. At this time, the average temperature reaches 30 degrees centigrade. The number of rainy days per month is only one. The sea is suitable for swimming from May to November. The best time for excursions is May when everything is blooming and September when we're caressed by a balmy southern breeze. The prevailing wind direction is south-southwest. Those who would like to catch the wind in their sails, whether they're sailors, surfers, kiters, or paragliders, had better know where the wind blows from. From the northwest comes the chilly, stormy Maestrale. The Ponente, coming from the west, is milder than this, but it can also grow stormy in spring or autumn. From the southwest arrive the blasts of the Libiccio wind. From the south, the Sirocco brings warm air from Africa. The Levante is a sultry air mass coming from the east. The Tramonta is a dry, fresh wind. The Mezzogiorno blows only in the morning. The Tirana at night to the direction of the sea. St. Florent was built on the shore of the St. Florent Bay, at the estuary of the River Aliso. The town is strategically as well situated as Bonifacio. It was the Romans who settled here first. Around 1440, it was the nest of the Genoans. They built the citadel that defines the image of the town even today. Under the foot of the castle, dominating the salient cliff, the houses almost reached the water. The medieval town surrounds the parish church. In the spring, the little town looks as if it were awakening from a winter dream. After the arrival of the first tourist, everything livens up. The number of permanent residents doesn't exceed 1,500. In summer, masses of people walk on the beach. St. Florent is not only the economic and commercial center of the Nebbio region, but it's also a very fashionable and popular holiday resort. The cuisine of Corsica was originally the cuisine of the poor. The restaurants still offer today what the people have eaten for centuries. We can get filling soups and one-course dishes, or roasts of pork, lamb, goat, or rabbit. With all this come lots of vegetables and herbs that are grown around the house. The sweets are mostly made from almonds and chestnuts. The flavors are a blend of French and Italian.
Patrimonio, lying on the edge of the fertile valley of Nebbio, is perhaps the most well-known wine-growing region of the island. Grapevines grow in orderly lines on the gently sloping hills. The winding road is framed by wine cellars. All cellars are open for visitors. It's possible to buy and taste wines here. The Gaffoni, Cepage and Lazzarini cellars offer a real specialty. Their Asu is a dessert wine that matches the best. While the men work in the vineyards and in the cellars all year, the women are not idle either. They make the liverwurst and sausages known all over Corsica, which serve as the basis of the wine tastings together with freshly baked homemade bread, onions and tomatoes that were grown in the garden. Those who are not satisfied with a cold dish can choose from the specialties of little restaurants. Ile Russe, the Red Island. The name was probably given because of the granite rocks which are red in themselves, but they're also colored blood red by the sunset. The landscape seems to be aflame at this time. The town was founded in 1758 by Paoli, whose statue stands on the square named after him. The 180 kilometers to be done from the capital of the French Riviera can be completed easily by either yacht or private plane, so Ile Russe has been a longtime favorite resort of French aristocracy. Many people like it in winter for its mild climate, many for its six kilometer long beach, others for its casino, which otherwise is a rarity in Corsica. All along the coast, rails have been laid down. In peak season, because of the large distances, a little train runs here. On the streets of the town, also known for its lively commerce, tourists can also linger. The main square named after Paoli and the promenade on the beach are framed by an endless row of hotels and eateries. There are a particularly large number of restaurants specializing in seafood, although there are not as many of these on Corsica as we might think. The harbor transfers the orange and olive shipments to the mainland. From there, some of them are transported on to other European markets. In the more protected inner harbors, the smaller vessels are anchored. Here we can see the nicest yachts and sailboats. At the markets, many ornaments, carvings, decorated plates and platters are offered. However, their main specialties are homemade delicacies. This tradition is cultivated with a fondness still today. Almost all families have their own carefully guarded recipes for the making of cheese, ham, sausage, or jams and liquors. The cheese is made mostly from sheep and goat milk and has a strong, piquant taste. The very popular brocciu is similar to the Italian ricotta. Pigs are kept wild in the woods. The meat of animals fatted on chestnut and acorns is especially tasty. The types of liverwurst, sausages, and hams are smoked on chestnut wood, and they're sold at twice the price as the import products. Despite this, it shouldn't be missed by gourmets. Herbs practically grow in the wild. We can find them in fresh or dried form at the markets. Honey comes from the flowers of the macchia. Jam is made from citrus fruits, figs, and forest fruits, and several types of oils and olives are available. Corsican wines are worthy of their popularity in all of France. The chestnut is not only eaten by pigs, they're processed in a numberless variety of different methods. Even beer is brewed from it. Myrtle and anise are used for making liquor. Seven kilometers from Iorus, in the interior of the island, stands the Santa Maria Assunta Cathedral. Saint Florian lies in the glass coffin of the cathedral, the Roman soldier who suffered martyrdom in the third century and who was canonized for this later. Corsica was attached to the Byzantine Empire by Emperor Justinian in 552, although Roman soldiers had been on the island for 250 years. They fought a century of wars in the interest of the spread of Christianity against the old inhabitants of the island, among which there were Iberians immigrating from Europe, Ligurians, and later Greeks and Libyans coming from Africa. 
The rocky parts of the coast where it's difficult to walk were occupied by Saracen pirates from the 8th century. Getting tired of the landlords fighting each other, the Pope donated the entire island to the Episcopate of Pisa. From 1284, rule was gradually taken over by the Genoans. We continue our journey on the coast towards the west. The protected Bay of Calvi was visited with fondness even by the Etruscans, the Phoenicians, and the Greek. The first harbor was built by the Romans. The name Calvi appears several times in history books. This is where Admiral Nelson, the later winner of the Trafalgar battle, lost his eye when on the invitation of Paoli, the English troops tried to conquer Corsica from the French. In World War II, the Marines of the Allied forces departed from here for the invasion of Normandy. The old town, built on a 30-meter high granite rock, is surrounded by the walls of an 18th century Genoan fortress. The most important building of the citadel, fortified with watchtowers, is the old governor's palace. The building is the training center of the Foreign Legion even today. A tunnel-like entrance leads to the castle district. On its wall, the epigraph Civitis Calvi Semper Fidelis, or Calvi always remains faithful, and the coat of arms of the town can be seen. It's probably only a myth that Christopher Columbus was born in this citadel. However, this possibility cannot be excluded completely, since when he was born, Corsica was under Genoan authority, so the Genoan origin could have meant Calvi also. Anyway, a memorial plaque was made for the famous explorer and was placed alongside that of Napoleon. Moreover, a street was also named after him. From the old practice grounds of the citadel, we reach the other famous site of Calvi, the church named after St. John the Baptist, which is famous for his penitential processions on Good Fridays. At this time, people march with their faces covered by hoods, with heavy crosses on their shoulders, hoping to gain absolution. The old building was rebuilt after the war against the Turkish. This is when it got its lantern cupola. Directly next to it lived Napoleon when he was a young artillery officer. The lower town with its harbor, cafes with colorful umbrellas, terraced restaurants, and the colorful promenade is the direct opposite of the calm upper town. The ships and ferries arriving from France call at Port Key Laundry. The passenger, cargo, and yacht harbors are separated by moles. The salt tower, defining the image of the harbor, was built as a watchtower by the Genoans. Later it functioned as a salt storage. It's worth looking back from the light tower at the end of the mole. The view from the citadel unfolds most completely from here, and this is the departure point of many cruises. The most scenic of them leads past the La Sandola Peninsula, which was declared a nature reserve, up to Girolata, 60 kilometers from here. On the way, many bizarre shaped sea caves can be seen. 80 kilometers from the capital, from among romantic cliffs, the view of Porto Bay opens up. It's worthy of being called the most beautiful part of the island. The blue of the sea is framed by pink granite rocks. Porto itself is only a little village. However, it's not the village, but the bay that we have in mind when talking about Porto. We can look down from this hillside covered with chestnut and olive woods to the little fishing village and the glittering beaches. The watchtower of the village, built on red rocks, watches today only the swimmers at most. 
In Porto, we can find a dozen hotels and two campsites. The place is extraordinarily popular in spite of its being at least a two and a half hour drive away from the closest airport or ferry on winding serpentines dotted with hairpin curves. The calmness, the tranquility, the sight of the magnificent nature is compensation for everything. The Aquarium of Porto is a collection of the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. Here we can see all of them together, even those that we weren't able to encounter when diving or fishing, or even on the tables of fish restaurants. There are many places for excursions in this area. It's worth visiting the rocky beach of Ficayola. Among the red porphyrite stones of Calanche, crashing rivers and rocky valleys alternate with green slopes. We can go on a several hour mountain hike from Piana to the Capo d'Orto, where we can have a magnificent view of the Porto Bay. Flocks of sheep and mountain goats often cause drivers to stop. A little patience and the shepherd arrives by car with his customary companion, his sheepdog, to get the traffic barrier out of the way. At a place between Porto and Ajaccio, the brave pilots were commemorated who first flew from Marseille to Corsica in a hot air balloon. Heading south, the road leading to the capital winds parallel with the seacoast. The capital of Corsica, Ajaccio, with its 60,000 residents, lies in the northern part of the bay of the same name. It's surrounded by a ring of green mountains, the background given by the Monte d'Oro. Here's the seat of the parliament of the province, where they deal with the issues of the whole country. Napoleon Bonaparte was born in Ajaccio and his name is associated inseparably with the name of the city. Here, everything is reminiscent of the ruler. But the city with its southern bustle is worth visiting for its other sites as well. The predecessor of Ajaccio was founded by the Greeks. It was completely destroyed by the Saracens and then it was revived by the Genoans. On the upper end of Austerlitz Square, an enormous Napoleon monument is to be seen. The Bonapartes traced back their family tree to the last Roman ruling house. The aristocratic family of Florence moved to Corsica in the 16th century. The lawyer Carlo Bonaparte married Letizia here, the daughter of a wealthy family of Ajaccio with Saracen origins. Thirteen children were born of their marriage, but five died young. They sent their second son, Napoleon, to a French military school to learn French in addition to his native Italian language. The Napoleon Museum has been established in the city hall. Original furniture, statues, and paintings commemorate the commander who was already a first lieutenant of the artillery when the Great French Revolution broke out. In 1793, as the commander of an artillery battery, he forced Toulon to surrender, and for this he was appointed Brigadier General. For his services, he was soon appointed the chief commander of the army against the Italians. Before he departed to the battlefield, he married the widow of an executed nobleman, Josephine, who was six years his senior. Napoleon piled on successes one after the other. He won every battle with his strategic genius. Returning home, 
He overthrew the Directory, and as First Consul he practically became the leader of the state. In 1804, he proclaimed himself Eternal French Emperor, which was confirmed by the people with a 3.5 million vote. Pope Pius VII anointed him in the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, and then Napoleon placed the crown on his own and his wife's head. He put his family members, siblings, and brothers-in-law on the thrones of Sicily, Spain, Holland, Naples, and Westphalia. Because they didn't have children, he divorced Josephine and married the young daughter of Emperor Franz of Austria, Mary Louise, who gave him an heir to the throne. He was the Prince of Reichstadt. It was he about whom the French poet Edmund Rostand wrote his romantic drama, The Eaglet. The cold of the Russian winter won a victory even over the troops of Napoleon. Out of the half million soldiers of the Grande Armée, only 8,000 returned. The emperor was forced to resign from the throne and he was exiled to the island of Elba. One year later, he returned to Paris to his Hundred Days reign, but after losing the Battle of Waterloo, he was permanently exiled to the island of St. Helena. He died six years later. He was buried in the Church of the Invalide in Paris with a luxurious ceremony. The birth house of Napoleon became the possession of the family in 1743. In the rooms furnished in Italian style, we can find the family tree, paintings, and coat of arms of the Bonapartes. Besides the salon, the dining room, and the hall, they also show the room where the emperor was born. The figure of Napoleon was made eternal by a myriad of books from André Gide to Georges Castelot. The battles of the strategist are still analyzed today. We can even play the Waterloo battle as a computer game. He was also portrayed on the movie screen countless times. His most famous impersonator was perhaps Charles Boyer. In 2002, a large-scale biographical film was made about him, starring Christian Clavier. The statue of Laboureur from the 19th century was surrounded by Maglioli, artist of Ayazzo, with fountains decorated with lions and pools. It's natural that all souvenirs in Ayazzo are decorated with Napoleon. Those on which his image doesn't appear are decorated by a gilded letter N. Among the souvenirs, some stylish pieces can be found. We can buy, for instance, a photo album displaying imperial memorial places or gilded coffee sets. We can send postcards to our friends portraying Napoleon, complete with a matching stamp. The imagination of souvenir sellers is inexhaustible. Nearby is the cathedral where the future emperor was baptized in 1771. The building was made according to the plans of the court architect of Pope Gregory XIII in 1582. The famous baptismal fount can be found behind the entrance to the right. The white marble main altar is a gift of Napoleon's sister. Of the artworks in the church, a painting of Delacroix stands out. The city of Ayacho can be divided into two parts. The old town stretches from the Place Marshal Foch to the citadel. A part of this is Borgo, the harbor district. Its houses with peeling plaster and worn cellar restaurants are scenic, 
as if we were in Naples or in Marseille. Here is the ferry harbor, the bus and railway stations. Lined with elegant and expensive clothes shops, the spacious Course Napoleon is a different world, where members of the upper class stroll. The modern part of the city has evolved from a little coral fishing village into a lively busy center. It's characterized by shopping streets, intimate little restaurants, and beaches. The citadel is in military possession to this day, so it cannot be visited. One open day is an exception to this, the third Sunday of September. The locals consider the Bay of Ayacho and its wider surroundings to be the most beautiful place in the world. The western side of the island, between Las Candola and Cargueza, is part of the nature reserve area of Corsica. As worded in a guidebook, steep red granite rocks rise from the sea, which sometimes spread as a mirror, sometimes cast wild, foamy waves in the narrow bay, from Cargis to the south, sandy beaches fall in line. The many tourist centers of the Bay of Sagona are more appealing than the more busy northwestern part. Here also, directly behind the coast, an area starts, crowded with strip-cultivated lands, which is called Sinarga. At the foot of the archaeological area of Filitosa, we can find excellent beaches. On the island, nudism is not a fashion, so no matter how deserted a beach may be, we should leave our bathing suits on. Going topless is usually allowed, but male tourists should not hope for catching a glimpse of Leticia Casta, the only top model of Corsica, who's recently launched an acting career. She already lives in Cannes. However, we can often hear the songs of another famous daughter of the island, Alizé, her CDs are placed prominently on shelves of the local shops. Filitosa was discovered in the 1940s, was excavated in the 1950s, and has been the most interesting archaeological site of the island ever since. We can go back to the unlikely distance of 4,000 years in the past. At the entrance, we can see the photo of archaeologist Roger Groschen, who led the excavations. On the uplands above the valley of the Taravo River, the menhirs from the age of the megalithic culture are exhibited in their original environment. According to scientists, this was the place where the Egyptian Taurian culture dominating this area from 1500 to 1000 BC and the other Stone Age culture that flourished from 2000 to 1500 collided. They're called, for lack of other information, people of the Great Stones. In some of the primitive buildings with cupolas, dolmens were built in, others were broken. This makes the victory of the Taurians in this old battle more likely. Do the Taurians have anything to do with Naragas living in Sardinia? Is it possible that they settled there, departing from this place, and they perfected their architecture there? Or did the two cultures develop simultaneously, and then mixing with the immigrants, did they disappear forever in the course of time? We can't be sure. The area is haunted by ghosts of bandits and vendettas. The village Solacaro near Filitosa was chosen by Dumas to be the stage of his historical novel, Corsican Brothers. In Fozzano, two families fought their bloody war. The houses of the Carabellis and Durazzos can still be seen. The figure playing the title role in Prosper Mary May's novel, Colomba, was a real person also. Her life was ruined by the vendetta as well. The woman deprived of her love and her son were buried in the chapel of Fozzano. Sartain lies to the south of Filitosa in the mountains. The world-famous writer Mary May, who arrived here as a monument supervisor, called Sartain the most Corsican city. Once a robber's nest, the home of the Vendetta is a significant tourist center today. The houses of Sartain blend into a rock precipice above the valley of Rizzanese. The gray buildings of the old town still breathe a medieval gloominess. The conflict strained once between the old and the new town. In the little tombs of the cemetery, many victims of Vendettas are buried. The new town, Borgo, was a district of the poor. Today, life is most active on the border between the two parts of town. Everybody benefits equally from the profit created by tourism. 
among the ruins of the old citadel, in the building of the prison, the Museum of Prehistoric Times has been set up. The Place de la Liberation, with its palm trees, is used as a marketplace in the morning. Excellent wines are grown around Sartain. The slate and limestone soil and the abundant sunshine encourage the growing of grapes. On the island, there are eight wine-growing regions, Ayacho, Pantramonio, Calvi, Capcors, Sartene, Figari, and Porto Vecchio. More than 20 million liters of wine are produced every year, almost 90% of which goes to export. The notation Van de Course indicates that the producer is a member of the Association of Wine Growers, where quality is controlled very critically. Propriano was a harbor even before Christ, used by the Etruscans and the Carthaginians. Its moles, lighthouse, and quay were built in the early 20th century to transport the crops of Sartena and its region. At the same time, it's the biggest crayfish harbor of the island. Those who look back on the island from the airplane departing from Corsica should not think that they've become experts of the island in just one or two weeks. There are still things to discover and things worth coming back for. Music